All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 25th of January. Already almost gone. Before you know it, we'll be putting out lawn chairs and mowing our lawns, right? Yeah, we wish anyway. Um, tonight, we have only have two main uh, thing, new things on the agenda this evening and then some old business. We've got uh, our minutes. We've got a budget presentation from the police department. Uh, we got our police chief there. We've got a budget presentation from the fire department. We got our fire chief there. And uh, then we've got our typical uh, state of emergency COVID updates, select board and town administrator updates. So with, without further ado, let's get rolling on this. Um, do our minutes from uh, January 19th. Motion. I'll second. All right. All those in favor of the minutes of January 19th? Aye. Aye. Was I supposed to use my left or right hand, Tom? Motion to left. <laughs> there you go. Right. The right right to okay. No, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Although, so don't forget everything's reverse on the on the well, camera. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Left, right. I'll just hold them both up just in case, you know. That's it, Dave. When you raise both hands, it's a state of confusion. That's right. I give up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, first up is our police chief with a budget presentation, and I think we've allotted about 46 seconds for that. So, no, go ahead. How are you doing tonight, Chief? Not too bad. How are you? All right. <clears throat> uh, so I emailed Jeff the uh, two uh, budget preps. One showed a 0% increase this day contract here um, for everybody and a 3% just to show a low end and a high end. Yep. Um, I did come back uh, again this year with a request for a full-time officer as I did last year. Um, and last year we had to cut that because of the uh, current COVID pandemic because uh, it's lasted so long. Um, and I also forwarded Jeff the capital improvement request forms. Um, one is for a cruiser replacement, the cruiser replacement to replace the uh, oldest car, which is a 2012 Chevrolet Tahoe. It's got just over 112,000 or around 112,000 miles and the townwide radio replacement that we were, uh, the police and fire uh, looking at doing the uh, rest of Franklin County. Yep. So on the screen, you'll see that the 8.43% um, total increase was the 0% COVID, I'm sorry, 0% COLA increase. Um, I've been saying COVID so many times it's replaced all my C words. Uh, Save that for later <laughs> in the meeting. Zero percent COVID is a good sentence. I like yeah, it. Exactly. Eventually, we'll get there. Um, most of us had a shot, so you know. Hopefully, everyone else will. Um, you'll see that there was a new officer increase uh, request, and to do that, uh, we did remove some of the overtime and part time. I don't know one hundred percent exactly how much of it we would have to reduce, but I did want to take a, a decent chunk out uh, to go forward from there. Um, and the other one is the uh, 3%, and that just shows you the max. That's, it. That's if the town had plenty of money and decided to give all of the um, employees a 3% increase, and that went from 8.4 to 10.7. Um. Any any general questions off the bat for anyone? For the chief? So let's see. So this is the Tahoe replacing that, right? Yes. Seems like we just replaced that one. No, uh, we replaced yeah. a- it was, uh, the, it was the other one, right? Yeah, the Tahoe is, and there's a, that's the, well, just went past it. The, uh, the, the cruiser fleet, that just shows you the cars that we currently have. Um, it does not show, uh, at some point before I get hired in 2016, uh, the town purchased a, I believe it was 2014 or 2015. It was a, a Ford Taurus. That one yep. was totaled, and right. that one was replaced by, um, You'll see car five, which is the Ford. That was a 2019 purchase. 
we will, if you want to call it lucky, we were lucky to get that replaced with uh, insurance because of the accident. Um, so we didn't have to pay for that. That was um, purchased through the uh, replacement uh, in the insurance. We were lucky enough to get that car. It was sitting on the lot. No one wanted it. Uh, it only had, you know, less than 20 miles. So we were able to pick that up. And that's why we have two 2017s. Uh, and th that's why the, the mileage is substantially different. Yep. That's um, an Explorer, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it technically it's the PIU, the Police Intercept Utility, but it's the Explorer that we all know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's car one. Car two is the uh, Chevy cool. Tahoe. That's the... 2012, and that's got the, now it's got 127,000. So I, I had written this back in, God, I don't remember all the days one together. Um, November, I think I wrote it, and that was 112,000 back then. Okay. Um, to uh, completely sidestep the Ford versus GM debate, but how's the, how's the Tahoe been overall? Well, that was, I think, our first SUV. It was well before me. Um, yep. It definitely has a higher clearance than the uh, Ford Explorers that we have. Um, I believe in general that there haven't really been any complaints. It's, it's a beast. The thing goes yep. in, in the snow, but, you know, we also have a, a, a pretty good uh, hybrid apartment. So we don't really have to worry about a lot of places where the yeah. you know, Explorer versus the Tahoe. That's what I was going to ask, like, right, if, if there's an, any necessity for that type of vehicle, you know, going forward when you replace it. Uh, it the only necessity would be is if, uh, I mean, we could try to replace it with another Ford SUV. If you remember uh, last year, um, Ford increased their prices dramatically. So um, that's why we went with the Dr. Durango. That was about eight grand less altogether. Yep. Uh, went from 56 down to 48 and a half. Um, so we could try to replace it with another Tahoe or we could try to replace it with another um, Ford uh, SUV. It, it all depends on what the town wants. Um, I have no problem going for another Ford SUV. I just have to keep it under the uh, allotted amount. Okay. <clears throat> and they're all wheel drive. So we don't have to worry about, you know, switching over to Ford. They're just always constant all wheel drive. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure any cruiser we get is going to be far better on gas mileage than the Tahoe is now. That's probably true. Yeah. Steve, have you looked at have you looked at uh, electric also? Uh, this year, I haven't looked at electric. The only ones that I've been looking at are the, the Ford SUVs, the hybrids, the Ford SUV gas. Um, we haven't looked at electric this year because uh, I didn't really get anywhere with them last year. The only ones I could find were the Volt and uh, a few of the other sedans. Yeah. Uh, but um, I don't know of any other departments, in, at least in this area, that have an electric cruiser for a patrol. But we, you know, nothing's off the table. I'll look at everything just to see what we can get. Yeah, I was just wondering if if uh, if, if you had talked to anybody that did have in house. You know their their ranges are extending out. I you know, I don't I don't know how you, I don't know what the charge time is. I guess probably like they have the quick charge is like 90, 90 minutes now, I think. But the the problem is is that we'd have to talk to somebody about putting in a charging station. Exactly. And that that could be problematic in itself. You know that that that's that's could if you ever did think about it, that's going to cost a few dollars. Yeah, we'll have to put one in the garage in the Sally Port for when the officer's on duty, and then yep. probably one in the back of the building for when the car is not on duty. Um, so that way, it either charges when it's off duty or when it charges when it's on, or whatever we can do with it. I know at one point there was a grant going back a few years ago when Sherry was here that um, they allow allotted for a uh, a certain amount of money towards a charging station for in the Sally Port, but I don't know if that's still available. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can look at like getting the charging port in before, you know, and then maybe then look at getting a an electric vehicle because the, the market's kind of slim right now on that. I mean, it's not like Tesla's whipping out uh, intercept Model S's, you know, yet. So, but, um, I don't know if anybody has has kept up the. There's a company Rivian, I think, that's partnered with Ford. Yep. That is putting out two new. There's a 
a truck and two new SUV models. I don't know if they're, they're supposed to be going on the market in the next few months. So I don't know if what their levels will be. Yeah, I've been watching those. Probably a little out of our price range at the moment, but I'm guessing they'll clock in at like probably around 100,000 the way it's been going lately. But hopefully- I remember, when I, I remember when I could build a cruiser fully for less than 34. Yeah. Now we can't just buy the, the vehicle itself before we build it for less than 34. Yeah, exactly. Prices are definitely going up. I think the average sedan vehicle price is now pushing 40. So it's getting expensive. Well, Chief, just, just, just be blessed that you're not buying fire trucks every five years. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely am, especially when the tires cost $200 a piece or $500 a piece or something. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, if you go to tire for $200 a piece, you better buy a whole bunch of them. <laughs> right. yeah. the, I, I'm not in the red zone, so I have no idea. There you go. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Chair, can I circle back away from cruisers for just a second, back to the expense side? Yep, I was going to get there. Yeah, go ahead. Chief, with respect to the additional full-time headcount, I appreciate the effort of trying to understand where the overtime uh, could be dealt with. Uh, it, our, our call volumes in the place that continue to warrant this, this has been perennial, so I figured I'd ask. Yeah, this is the second year I've asked. Um, so the call volumes historically uh, for the past few years, I showed you have been going up. Um, the, the one year that we thought was maybe an anomaly is when we saw a, a giant increase. And that's, we likened a lot of that to be because we were properly documenting everything. Mm -hmm. But then last year I came to you and showed you that the numbers had still steadily increased. So it was showing more of um, not just officer involvement, but the uh, the public involvement with us and, and us getting out there and, and being called on and having more calls. Um, this year, it's a, it's a little bit skewed. We do have an increase in numbers, but we don't have, um, I don't have all the exact data yet because it's still kind of early for me to get all the stuff done, uh, but dealing with the, uh, the pandemic. Um, so, one thing to note is, you know, while motor vehicle enforcement um, went down dramatically because a lot of people stayed home and right. there were a lot of commuting, uh, the other calls stayed the same or increased. Um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, while motor vehicle stops dropped, um, domestic assault and batteries and uh, disturbance calls increased because of whatever reason. Um, so we've steadily uh, continued on with the, uh, the upward climb of the call volumes coming in. Uh, we've been lucky enough to keep um, a good majority of the schedule covered by full-time officers. And we use our part-time officers for uh, 24 to 30 hours a week um, without benefit time, <clears throat> excuse me, without uh, you know, officers calling in sick or using vacation time or holiday time. Um, so we've been, we've been pretty lucky with covering all of the shifts uh, across the board um, uh, and, and then dealing with a lot of the subsequent investigations. Uh, we've had uh, a little bit of luck in getting some grant money secured. So uh, I know uh, I've spoken to a lot of residents who've seen a lot more motor vehicle uh, enforcement that's due to one of the grants. Uh, but uh, prior to those coming in, uh, we had been uh, on par with the year before, uh, actually more than uh, the year before. So we have had an increase, um, but I don't have the percentages like I had for you last year. Last year, I was able to show you color graphs in right. the, the year before that. Uh, I will get that together and, and forward it to Jeff so you guys can see that as well. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. I'd be, I'd be curious to see that. And then if there's, especially like the times of the calls too, if any of that has changed, you know, like the window of that. Yeah. If you remember uh, last year and the year before, when I brought to you the presentation, the, the color graph showed that Wednesday was the quietest day, if you will, quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, I hate using that word because it's always yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, but definitely lower in calls uh, than say Sunday. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure I could probably get the system to break it down into the hour time, but we showed days and the days were you know, uh, fluctuating between uh, call volumes and obviously um, the day shift is far busier than the midnight shift. Um, right. and I'm not taking anything away from the midnight shift. It just means that um, we have more people awake um, and more commuting traffic. So right. the call volumes are, are, are greater. It doesn't mean that the calls at night are uh, 
any more safe than the ones during the day. In fact, some of them can be a lot worse. Tom, did you, were you going to say something? Um, well, I have a question for the chief. Chief, with the, the new uh, police reform bills that was signed, how, I, I mean, I, I read through it and I, I don't understand at all, probably like 1%. But one, one thing I did see was certification of all officers um, and certification of the department. So, I mean, have you addressed some of those? And now when I look at it, it looks like it's gonna to be tough to get part-timers now because everybody's gonna to have to have the same level of training. So that means part-timers are gonna to have to go to school for the 800, 900 hours like a full-time officer. And, so, and have you and have you have you looked at addressing some of the expenses that I mean there I think there's going to be significant in expenses with that going there's forward. There's going to be significant increases for expenses. So you may see across the board certain individuals um, deciding that they're paying more to be certified than they're making every year, and there may be some officers who decide to uh, leave. Uh, you'll also see a core group of officers who will, as some people call them, uh, Velcro cops. They'll go from, you know, they'll share three or four towns and just peel off the patch and put on the next one for the next town and uh, kind of like a Velcro patch. And they'll work for three or four towns part time. Uh, and that would be a little bit um, more feasible for them to, to do that because their certifications could be spread across because your certification isn't department specific. It's to be within the, the uh, Commonwealth. So you may see some officers working for two departments, um, but the general idea is it's going to cost money, whether it's individual uh, cost or shared cost with a department, that's something I believe we'll have to see. Um, the earliest we're gonna start, some of the things came into place you know, immediately. Some of the other things won't come into place until July. And then um, as the part-timers uh, have been, um, been watching on their uh, on the on the the alerts they've been sending out. Some of them are going to have you know one year to get certified, and others will get you know three years to get certified. Um, I guess the going rate right now, uh, the decision on that is is based on your alphabet uh, last name. So if me, if I was part time, I'd have the first year. I'd have to get it done, and somebody with the last name starting with a Z would have longer. Um, but we're trying to get. Uh, a level playing field across the board uh, through uh, Massachusetts to allow some of these officers more than just one year, maybe get them all to get done at the same time or give them all the same amount of time. Um, but we don't know if that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna fly. So the cost itself is gonna increase. Um, we have it in the budget for part-time officers and for full-time officers to uh, do their 40 hours every year, but um, that's going to have to increase at some point. And then we'll have to figure out as a department and as a town, um, do we want to keep uh, as many officers that we have? Um, and because obviously they all have to be certified. Um, and by doing that, um, we'd have to have some type of agreement uh, to determine whether or not they would be certified with us or shared certification throughout other departments. So that's something we'll have to uh, keep a close eye on and see where we're going to go from here. So, so have you looked at what it would cost for the town of Sunderland's police department to become certified? Not fully yet, because we're, I, I, like you, I've been going through those uh, printouts and trying to read everything and having an amazing amount of Zoom meetings to, with others to discuss um, what exactly is going to be needed uh, for a department of our size. Um, you know, we obviously don't have a huge budget so we have to work within our means. Um, and, you know, I believe that there's gonna to have to be a decision made by individuals too. Uh, individuals that work part-time for departments, are they gonna stay on because of some of the burden is gonna be uh, theirs or are they gonna only work for departments that would deal with the certification and the cost of that themselves? That I don't know. So we're gonna to have to wait and see, but we're gonna be working towards that. So, so why why I mention this, Mr. Chair, yeah. is is I, I don't know personally if the town of Sunderland or towns of size of Sunderland 
are going to be able to afford police departments going forward and by on, on their own not, not i mean not right i i i hope that makes makes sense but it, it's almost like they're they're pricing we're going to be priced out um of being able to have local police um because of the changes um i, I don't know chief if you if you talk to others if if that's i i just when i just look at the cost of i, I mean how many certified departments are there in Franklin County right now. I think maybe Greenfield, maybe. I I would assume Greenfield. Usually the bigger towns in, in cities, uh, there's two, there were two levels currently before this was passed uh, to get accredited. And uh, to be accredited, you had to become either certified or uh, fast track it up to be accredited. Um, right. So at the very least, every department from a small town of less than a thousand to uh, towns that uh, are still towns, but they're rather large, they'll have to get it the very minimum certified. So that's something we'll have to, you know, definitely look at and continue with. Um, you know, we, we had for many years an accreditation system, um, and we have to see if that's going to still tie into this through the post system, or are they going to join forces, or what are they going to do? So there's still a lot of uh, unknowns that we're still picking through with council and um, legislature to see, you know, if we're allowed to do that, can we continue down that path or are we going to abandon that and go forward? So we have to, you know, it's tough to make a, uh, give you an answer right now as to where we're going to be with that uh, because uh, there are plenty of other problems smaller and larger than ours that don't even know yet. Yeah, I, I so I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say also to the other board members is that it's something that we're going to have to watch very, very closely and finance committee because Nope. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Again, I, I mean, again, I don't read that. I don't read it the same way the chief reads it because I don't know, but I, I just know the, one of the things that stood out to me is like part-timers. I mean, we, that, that's how a lot of officers get their initial um, training is they go to the, the part-time academy. A lot of them paid for it themselves. And all of a sudden you're going from, and you're going from a part-timer that has two, 300 hours of training up until now eight, 900 hours of training. It's a, it's a big, big commitment. On well, the, the MPTC has already uh, stopped any future part-time academies. They've only authorized certain ones. So yeah. those are the last ones to go through until hopefully they can have an idea of where we're going to go and how we're going to do this. Because uh, a lot of the counties would host their own academies. So yeah. Central Mass, Franklin County, Hampshire County, Hamden County, they would go through and host them, usually through the Chiefs Association or through the Sheriff's Department, and they would get authorized by the MPTC and go forward. Um, there are people who are working the streets today that, you know, did the part-time academy in the 90s. That wasn't 300 hours back then. That was 120, maybe. Um, so they're still working. Uh, so, but the idea was in Massachusetts, a lot of, not a lot, all the officers had to go through and do yearly training as well. That's why we have a training line on them in there. So the part-timers go through and they have to do what they call in-service. Uh, full-timers do the same thing. They do their in-service and they, make sure they get that complete. Uh, the state rolled out a new system, um, called ACADIS. And that's something that the full-timers and part-timers are going through. They can go back and look at their system uh, and see where they're at for certification. Um, it's not like, you know, going down to Billy Bob's and shooting a couple of rounds through paper or going to, you know, your friend that can teach criminal law classes and say, you're good. There's a whole process you have to get done before you can be finished with your in-service every year. Uh, so now we have to figure out as a department, what do we have to do to get certified? And then as individual officers, from me all the way down to the brand new one. Uh, what do you have to do every year? So. Thank you, Chief. Um, sounds like some potential changes coming to, you know, we may have to even look at things like, you know, regional sharing of part-time officers or something like that in terms of the cost saving, you know, sharing or something, but. Well, the only, the only thing about that, Dave, is it's a really not a cost savings. 
because if you're sharing if you're sharing time part-time employees when they're work when they're working or not working you can be paying they could be working for you but if they get laid off in another town you're paying you're paying their unemployment well that's or true if they get hurt you're paying their their workman's comp rates also so it, it, it's a or or if they need a if they need a, a kevlar vest i mean you may be buying it for to work in another town so i don't necessarily know if it's a, a savings to tell you the truth it's going to be interesting to see how it pan, <clears throat> pans out all right thanks any <laughs> any other uh questions for the chief <laughs> sound like this is going to be an interesting couple of years headed up oh yeah and then the last thing I put on was the townwide radio replacement. Um, I put that in for uh, both police and fire. Um, Chief, you, yeah. should have left, you should have left it with the fire department. They, you know, <laughs> after five hundred thousand dollars last year, that little radio <clears throat> was just inconsequential. Yeah. Hey, Stevie, Chief uh, Chief Eric jumped on it, and I, <laughs> I did, I, I, I didn't pull him off of it. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, we all know that's coming, so. Yeah, we, we tried to do a grant. Uh, the grant, obviously, we put in for more because we wanted repeaters as well. Um, right. And uh, we weren't successful in getting that grant. Um, if we can get that grant in the next couple of years, then obviously uh, I say we go for it again. And it won't be as much as what we initially requested uh, through the grant, but that's something that we could try to get more repeaters because we'll know where we are once the, the system is in place. You know, um, I believe we're at a, what Steve, a 95% coverage rate for the, the, the new radio system without repeaters, but that's not counting in the buildings or in the basements. Well, it, exactly. When we had an opportunity to test the system as it is now, understanding it's gonna be built out uh, to some degree um, soon, probably it's happening now. Yeah, we're at about 95%. Uh, the, the big Achilles heel was inside buildings. And yeah. um, that's, you know, we can use your imagination on how important that is. It's just a, um, and it's very hard to gauge because you can't very well get inside of everybody's basement to test. Um, the best that we did was went inside of the buildings that we had access to or permission to go in and check those out. Does it, does anybody, I, I don't know if you know this, Chip, do any towns work with, um, the apart, especially once you get over a certain size with like apartment complex owners to like have repeaters mounted around there or something. Does that? Yeah, that is, it's in the building code. So newer buildings would right. have to have at least a test conducted. Um, uh, developments such as 116 Flats, Sugarbush Meadows failed the test and had to put in a signal boosting system. And that is going to have to get upgraded um, with this new, uh, with the new radios. Um, yeah. So they, they do. Uh, I spoke to, on my side, I spoke to the uh, Department of Fire Services at length, and it is very hard, very hard, they say, to get existing buildings that were built under a previous code to install the systems. Uh, I'm sure. Hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars to put these in and it's yeah there's no real hammer in the code to get it done to a building built in the 70s yeah and if it's that expensive they're not going to want to eat the cost themselves so no no amount of goodwill is going to cough up that kind of money on their part yeah that's true so but that that's that's not repeaters though that that's wiring internal right it is but it, they they effectively act as repeaters <clears throat> they're installing a repeater in each building that in turn talks with the main radio uh, towers that we would use. So, so how, when, when, how would your repeaters that you're proposing to buy, how would that differ from what they have? Well, it wouldn't, but that's only one building. Right. We don't, we, you know, they, in theory, the repeaters would not be needed in route 116 flats because they would have, that uh, technology built into their infrastructure. Yeah. But with the other apartment complexes in town, they don't have it. So 
we would need the repeaters to be able to communicate out of the out of the basements yeah. primarily. Like we had that that fire call down at Delta Sand and Gravel, and we were up against the uh, the sand pit, and uh, portable was not getting out. Even the truck radios were not getting out. So a repeater system, um, because we were on the backside of the the the, the sand pit, and we couldn't uh, reach the, uh, the 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 radio tower. So a mobile repeater for each vehicle, uh, you'd be able to flip that switch on, and then each portable would then connect to that. And when you uh, key your mic on a five watt portable, it would then go to the truck or the cruiser and then get boosted up to a 40 watt. Okay. That's so line of sight. It's so, it'd still be hard to still have, to, you're in a hole. Yeah. It, it almost next to impossible to, to, to radiate out of a hole like that though. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if what, would it, what would it cost for a complex to put in a repeater? Right. It's a it's it's about that same amount of money, because what we're running into is the and I'm not a radio expert. Um, yeah. You you guys are probably more able to talk specifics than I am. However, the thing that we run into is things like wire lath, um, wiring technology, um, internet Wi-Fi can frustrate the digital radio signals. Yeah. So when you've got um, a brand new building with a lot of electrical uh, and uh, technology running, it shortens up your radio's ability to reach outside. Mm. And if you've got something like a, um, a building with, with stone, wire, lath, plaster, what have you, that does it too. So you could put in um, smaller repeaters and get coverage throughout the whole building. Right. Or you can have a mobile repeater in a truck. You take Cliffside, for instance, the, the uh, lower number buildings to the west on Route 116 over towards the center of town, you could have uh, a truck parked out out there and that would communicate with those buildings just fine. But you could walk over to the uh, newer buildings over to the east side it wouldn't pick up the truck at all. So they could put a system in, but they'd have to put a lot of smaller repeaters in to cover the entire complex versus the mobile that would, granted it's at our cost, but it would essentially move to where the communication was needed in most cases. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand I'm just saying you're you're going to be putting them in all all you you're looking at repeaters in the trucks and all the fire trucks and all the cruisers. Is that the plan? Well, we with this with this dollar amount that I put down, no, because each repeater is about twelve and a half thousand dollars. Right, so you're looking at a longer term plan to get it in, ideally, but yeah, I on my, it in. I think I put mine down to have one. Uh, and I was going to put it on the midnight car because that's usually the car that is, you know, if they're by themselves, they need a repeater because uh, they don't have the, the luxury of having a second officer speaking for them. Because um, usually in the day shift, we'll try to have one or two uh, or you have more uh, resources nearby to pull off of. Um, I think initially on the grant, I had tried to put four repeaters and the fire department had four or five repeaters. Um, but because it's such a huge cost um, and we have to fund it all, uh, I think we dropped it down to one each or maybe two, I can't remember, Steve, but yeah. um, it's, it's a twelve and a half thousand dollars cost for a repeater to be mobile. So um, I'm, I'm banking on the fact that 95% coverage will give us a good coverage that we can rely on. And then if we have the need to increase uh, our repeater coverage, then, um, you know, keep picking at grants to see if we can get some state or federal funding to pay for that instead of town monies. Yep. That's just my belief. So in your, in going back, back to your, back to your cruiser, looking for your cruiser, is that spec going to be spec with the new digital radio inside of it? Or does it already have digital radio? The, the, no, the 800 no, megahertz. No. No, no, the, the, the new cruiser. So, 
in theory, what's supposed to happen is um, we're supposed to get all of the radios installed between May and August. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, this cruiser wouldn't be authorized to even be built until after July 1st. So they'll build the car and then they'll start implementing all of the uh, installing all of the uh, equipment. And then when it comes time to swap it from the Tahoe to that, we drive it over, they take out what we're, what we're going to be reusing. Uh, depending on the vehicle we get, if we can keep some of the stuff that's still there, like say, say we had another Tahoe and the cage worked okay, we would swap the cage out, uh, the prisoner cage. Um, the chances of that happening are probably going to be slim to none because it's a nine year difference and it's a different vehicle. Uh, but they do build into the cost of the cruiser. Uh, I think it's $150 to transfer the radio. So whatever radio we have from car one to car two or car A to car B. So the, the, the dollar amount request for the cruiser is only to swap the existing equipment over. So by the time we get the new car, we'll already have all the digital radios in the existing cars. Okay. So you don't have to spec, you just spec for the swap. Yes. Okay. All right. And this car is not spec to have a um, repeater. So what you see for a cost is what you see. It's not going to be a, a, a repeater snuck in there. <clears throat> All right. It's riveting information. If you want yeah, to just it, it, talk about radios, <laughs> uh, if you ever, ever have problems sleeping, give me a call and I can talk to you about radios. There you go. Put it right out. At least it puts my daughter out. So you should start a relaxation podcast. You know. <laughs> <sighs> All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> And I don't think bake sales will cover that funding difference either, probably. So, you know. Probably not. All right. All right. Any other questions for the police chief? All right. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to put myself on mute because I'm losing my voice. Uh, that's all right. <clears throat> ah, now we turn it over to the other side of the building, the right side, as it were, which has been doing a great job lighting up for the holidays it's kind of dark on the other side geez i don't know you know well you know we all take we we all have our our creative streaks <laughs> and i right. think the lights i think the lights are scheduled to come down pretty soon so i was gonna say um, yeah in, enjoy them while they can they'll get rolled up and put back on the shelf there um, you go but no uh appreciate everybody's time this evening and um just to jump in quickly give everyone an overview there, there were some increases that I asked for. I can go through those in a, in a minute here, but um, primarily they're dealing with uh, public safety, complex expenses, some payroll uh, that's really been a perennial, um, uh, perennial underfunded situation, and then looking at uh, firefighter equipment. So looking at the, um, the public safety complex, I had a small increase in there um, primarily for oil and my apologies. I don't know. There isn't an increase percentage increase shown on this. I apologize for, for, uh, omitting that, but essentially in years past, we've had a fixed cost for oil. And while the temperatures differ and we can cover the, the challenges that we have with the heating system, uh, at another time, it's been somewhat predictable to look year to year about what our, um, our oil costs will be. This year, uh, we don't have that fixed oil cost. And uh, conveniently, as we're starting to get into the heart of the winter, the oil prices have been going up. Uh, not dramatically, but they've been creeping. Um, can look at a lot, of, a lot of indicators, but that's probably gonna continue for a little while and then level off and, and drop down. So what I requested was another $4,500 in the public safety complex budget, primarily to cover oil expenses and heating expenses. And that's a fairly large increase uh, against what the total budget is, but uh, it's one of those things that we don't have a lot of control over. Uh, we, on our side, we try to keep the building as cool as possible. Uh, let's the uh, with the set points and what have you. 
and it just seems to be one of those things. If we end up getting a more favorable cost for oil next year, uh, certainly the money won't get spent. Uh, but the last thing that I want to do is have to worry about looking at um, getting more funds for that account when we get into the middle of the tail end of the, uh, the winter. Um, and that's not really fair to uh, spring on everybody. Uh, just trying to anticipate that ahead of time. The next thing uh, going down the list uh, is a relatively large increase for uh, firefighter payroll, and that's hourly payroll, um, about a 35% increase and um, asking for another 7,300 and some odd dollars. Uh, the story behind that is I've been chief for a bunch of years and every single year that I've been chief, I've had to go through the reserve transfer request process for more money for payroll. And even um, my predecessor had to do the same thing. And while our call numbers have been pretty stable, and ironically enough, the, the numbers of calls dropped a little bit last year. Uh, but the one, the one bugaboo is the time that we spend on the calls is going up. Uh, it seems like we're getting fewer uh, nuisance calls and we're getting more, um, more calls that take some time. Um, one of the larger uh, issues that we run into is a uh, fire alarm going off at, um, uh, at a building and we show up and we find that somebody burned food nine times out of 10, the one time out of 10, they've actually started something on fire. Uh, but we get that dealt with. We try to reset the alarm. We can't reset the alarm. Uh, one of the other residents has taken a device down. So the, the, the system won't reset. We can't really leave unless there's an alarm tech there with the alarm not functioning properly. So we've got to search for that system. I'm sorry, that device. Um, when we get into the, uh, the medical calls, uh, helping South County Ambulance, we've had several of those this year. Uh, with critically ill patients. The, uh, the world now is not just put on a pair of gloves and go in and do CPR. Um, in a lot of cases, it's uh, a full um, gown, face shield, masks, so forth, and then what amounts to a decontamination afterwards. So uh, the on-scene time for us has gone from, in rough terms, less than an hour to a little bit more than an hour. And if you just multiply that by 100 so calls a year, um, we get this creep upwards of, uh, of costs. And my attempt is just to fund that line item properly and not have to go back for, I think last year I went back three or four times for a reserve fund request, $3,000, $4,000. Um, and it gets to be a challenge to keep clean books uh, on everybody's part when that happens. Um, and the last request I asked for, uh, just about 7% for uh, fire department expense. And that's really to get us back to where we were pre-COVID uh, budget compromise for equipment, uh, turnout gear and things like that. Uh, we can do a pretty good job with that $33,000 a year uh, budget in terms of paying off all of our, uh, all of our annual expenses, recertifications for equipment and so forth and keep the, uh, keep the gear in place in good repair, uh, buying the odds and ends that break or that we need to have replaced. Uh, and then every couple of years coming back for a, a capital request. Um, so it's my request, uh, my reasons for that. Um, everything else seems to be pretty well in line. The only wild card would be the radio system. Uh, I haven't requested anything else for that because we've gotten no guidance in terms of increased costs or decreased costs from the COG uh, for next year. And at some point that $8,000, $9,000 will cease to be an expense for us when everything is shifted over to the uh, digital system. Uh, but the challenge now is the old analog system will have to remain because that is what is being used for paging and dispatch, the initial tones for fire. Um, as the digital platform was built out, uh, initially at least there was no provision made for that element of our operation countywide. 
so we'll be dispatched come late summer let's just say uh, we'll be dispatched off of the old radio system with the old towers and our old pagers and then that will transition over to uh, talking on the uh, on the digital system our hope is that within a year or two we'll have a digital solution so we can completely abandon the analog radio system but until that happens we're going to have to pay that radio maintenance fee and um, and keep the old system functional. Mm. Okay. So, any, any questions? I, uh, I'll just say that uh, I, I definitely understand the uh, wages increase. Uh, the uh, finance was first scheduled to on Friday to meet to authorize a funds transfer that I know is pending. So uh, as soon as we yeah. get quorum, right? Yeah, and, and I didn't do that on purpose to sort of bring it to the forefront. It's just just the way the numbers went. <laughs> so the, so the calls go. It is, it is. Uh, did you want to talk about capital or anything or it's another? I, I, I don't have any capital requests. Uh, Chief Demetropoulos was kind enough to um, Again, really tackles the, the radio capital. Um, we, we were uh, fortunate to get our capital request last year uh, for the air packs. And um, through that department uh, budget funds and also some very generous benefactors in town, we were able to accomplish that project. So great example of everybody uh, chipping in a little. And um, I don't have any capital uh, requests now Everything that is on the on the books, in terms of projects, we should be able to take care of through uh, some of the sundry grants that we typically get. Whether it's a MEMA grant, um, we're going for FEMA grants to um, uh, try to replace our uh, filling station for those new air packs. Uh, we we can fill the packs adequately with the current equipment that we have. Uh, challenges like everything else, the um, the new packs have technology built into them uh, to comply with the new um, the new codes from the NFPA and the new laws. But there there needs to be a um, uh, it's essentially an RFID tracking system to show when packs were filled and uh, to show what bottles were filled when and and there's a essentially a chain of custody with the air that goes into them with carbon monoxide monitoring and so forth. Uh, right now, we don't have any of that. So uh, we're gonna try to uh, try to get granting for that. And if that fails, then uh, we'll probably be coming to you for that next. Okay. Um, I, I will say, um, I don't envy anybody that's gonna look at, um, at town budgets, but uh, we do have beautiful functional new fire truck for the town. Um, that's doing a great job. I heard about yep. that. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it won't be long. Um, probably another five or 10 years, we'll have to start talking about uh, another new truck to replace the second line truck. Uh, again, not an imminent cost, but uh, if there was any way to uh, sock away a few thousand bucks and uh, maybe let it earn some interest, um, I would... Uh, I would recommend that too, but uh, can't, with things can't do that, CV. <laughs> yeah. With things with things being where they are, the uh, state doesn't the state doesn't allow us to do that any I'm longer. Sure. Manner of speaking, the expense is coming, and um, being ready for it in another eight or ten years wouldn't be a bad idea if there's some means to do that. Yep. All right. Any other questions for the chief? All right. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll mute and hang around for a bit. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I would, ask, I, I would ask the chief is how much longer do you, can a, a town of our size afford a, we said it to the chief, the police, but how, how much longer can we afford a fire department? That's a valid question. 
Well, and, it, it, and I, 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 I'm again, it's not that not, not we're going to have a police department, we're, we're going to have a fire department, but can a, a town of 3,000 residents, can it maintain a, a, a compliant NFPLA or NFPA compliant fire department? Hmm. Well, you know, we've had those conversations before hmm. in the years past too, and look, we're probably coming back around to them again. Well, it, it's, you know? I mean, we could, I, I mean, you, you look at, you, you look at a, it's, it's getting tougher to have volunteers and, and, and really we, in, Steve, in Steve's request for additional funding for, for, for the members of the department, basically, you know, 30 years ago, when you said volunteer firefighters, they did not collect money for training. Training was different. Now, now it's mandated training, um, but the fire, the you know, the fire guys today um, are looking. You know, they they are are being basically their call call firemen, fire people. That's what we have, and we do we do have two different wage scales. Um, the firefighters make five bucks an hour for training, yeah. so it's so it's less than the hourly train the hourly pay uh, when there's a call, but. The one thing, the, the costs to provide services to town to the town of Sunderland uh, probably won't differ a lot. If you look at your, um, if you broke it down to a cost per hour of services rendered to have the availability, the equipment within a certain amount of um, uh, distance that the insurance companies would recognize as being appropriate, um, it's probably not going to be a lot different. We might be able to, uh, when the time comes, partner with another town for, you know, the standard, uh, standard, um, uh, standard things, the air packs, the gear, and so forth. But, um, you know, and, and trucks and so forth. But uh, we'd still have to look at that insurance element. And um, I don't think it would be favorable to not have trucks and equipment here in town, whether they're shared. Yeah, valid, uh, valid conversation, but it's, uh, you know, got to look at utilization and, and what all those costs are. It may not be much different than what we have now. As long as we have the people, uh, we're probably in a good spot to keep going as much as we can with the basics and then partnering with other towns for ladders and rescue trucks, um, other sorts of uh, expensive devices that we don't use all that often. And I guess that's my, that's, that, that's the point, you know, I, you know, you, you, in, in, you just talk about the next truck, Steve, you know, you talk about the next truck, Steve, and the, the, the KME was um, probably 200,000. The Smeal was 300 and 310,000. And this last one was 509,000. So it's pretty safe to say that, the next truck yeah. that we're going to get is probably going to be close to three quarters of a million. Um, yeah, so it could be. That, that, and and so you have to ask yourself how 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 is how are you best? How can you best? How's how's the town best served? Do does a town need two front line trucks? Hmm. I, I don't know. And and if and again, it goes back to that cost of. You know, and I, I haven't done the math uh, to say, okay, every time the, that the truck rolls out, it costs the town, you know, with depreciation and everything else, you know, $300, let's just say. Right, like um, a per cost call. You know, per, per cost, you can, you could massage it with hours and all that. But um, looking at inflation and, and everything else, maybe we decide not to have two frontline trucks at that, at that point. And we just have one, or maybe we can get a truck that yeah, will have more apartments are coming. Fuck it, more on. the um, the appropriate equipment and the um, the appropriate equipment and partnering with other towns. It may be feasible. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I don't think it's going to be too much. Too much down in the future, we're going to have to start looking at that, Steve. And mm-hmm. And, and, and just and just be in, in how, to, how to provide the service the the love the level of service right now we got a we, we got a great service 
but you know, just like we found with the ambulance, you you not, not may not be able to maintain the uh, the volunteers like you do now going forward in another ten or fifteen years either. So, hmm. oh, absolutely, we've got a good group now. Yeah. In another five or ten years, you know that demographic could change, okay. and uh, but we've also got to see who do you partner with, and yeah. um, you know whether you've got um, similar towns that you could work with. You know, we've got a district to the north and a district to the west that um, you know, that structure just doesn't uh, allow an integration all that easily. Um, but, you know, it's all on the table. Absolutely. Thank yep. you, Stevie. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chief, before you did, did you want to talk about I think there was recently some donated equipment, uh, fairly expensive. I don't know if you wanted to mention can do that, certainly. Um, about two weeks ago, I had a conversation with Chief Spanknable in Hadley um, about a, a set of surplus hydraulic extrication uh, tools that they had. Uh, they're old Hearst Jaws of Life tools. Uh, they're probably 20, 25 years old. They had replaced them um, because for their uses, they had been um, uh, just past their useful life. Uh, they're using their tools a lot with Route 9 and uh, getting called onto Route 91 for, for help yeah. occasionally. So um, Chief Spank Nabel asked me if there were something that we could use. Uh, we have a set of hydraulic tools. They are old, they're probably 12 years old by now, maybe older. And uh, I said, I'd love to take a look at them. Long story short, uh, we're now the proud owners of a surplus set of uh, cutters and spreaders. Uh, hydraulically powered for uh, auto extrication and um, the town of Hadley surplus them they were given to us with the um, uh, with the request that if they needed the tools in town that we would uh, be able to respond and help them out so uh, we've got that and you know, uh, Tom just like you were saying there's a great example of a little bit of cooperation it doesn't account for much on the um, on the spreadsheet but it's, uh, it helped us out and they know where they can go if they need the tools again. Absolutely, Steve, that's what it's all about. That's our, our yeah. Thanks to Hadley for that, it's Indeed. really appreciated, yeah. It's one of those things you hopefully you'll never have to use, but if you do, you've got it. And we use them occasionally, so it's good yeah. to have them. Yep. All right, all right, thanks for that, appreciate it. All right, it's that time in the evening where we move down to our, and I see Laurie out there, and we move down to our COVID-19 update. <sighs> what's our what's our color report looking like tonight, Laurie? Okay. I think we're gonna go back to possibly yellow. I don't think we're gonna be in the red this week. Um, but I've also found out that I might not be getting all of the data that I need to accurately compile a report for you. So I'm gonna have to have a little meeting with um, Caitlin and Cheryl to see what a better way of mining the data is so that we can have a complete and accurate report each week. Okay. So you'll run into some roadblocks with some information there. I unexpectedly yes I didn't know I wasn't getting the data um, Jeff forwarded me a report that he received from Caitlin and it had on some UMass data four or five cases from UMass over the past couple of weeks that I knew nothing about so you know that changes everything for me um, to report to you folks so I just have to figure out a way how to get accurate data Okay. Oh my God. So, um, you know, last week we only only we only had eight new cases last week, which is significantly lower than it has been. That's good. So, yeah, <clears throat> we are trending down. That's that's a good sign. Hopefully, we're we're past some of our spikes there. <clears throat> I certainly hope so. And then with uh, with vaccinations rolling along and starting to come in, that that should hopefully help things. So. Yes, for sure. 
So, Mr. Chair, hmm. talking about vaccinations, um, we, uh, I was we, hoping we, you'd lead into that. Well, we've, we've been, I, I mean, I, I've been talking to um, Liz Foster, who's a chair of our COA, Council of Aging, and Jeff, and, and it goes back to Phyllis's comment a couple weeks ago concerning notification of yep. people and how, how they get vaccinated. And if, and if you really read what's out there, um, there's a lot of angst amongst people because most people don't know where to get the information from. Um, so what Jeff, Jeff and I were talking about with Liz was about, um, and Lori, you may, may correct it, but the last we heard, we're supposed to be entering the beginning of phase two, um, first week of February. First, yes, that's right. what I've heard. Yep. So that hasn't changed yet. No. So Good. not that we know okay. of. So yeah. Jeff, so so there is a site, and Jeff Jeff has it up up there right now. Um, and phase two talks about individuals seventy five years and above that are eligible. Um, we don't still, we don't know exactly where, when this starts, although we're, we're told it's supposed to start February, when beginning of February. We don't know exactly where um, vaccines are going to be offered, although we believe that UMass will be offering them at the Mullen Center, I mean at the uh, campus center. And also, they're going to be in um, probably Greenfield as well. But these things haven't been relayed to us. We just want our residents to know is that this is something that we are looking into, I would say daily, but it's more like hourly um, when the information is being passed along. Matter of fact, I have a meeting, I have a meeting Thursday night with the FERCOG um, and Fer FERCOG actually has a seat on the, uh, the statewide board for the vaccination. So we should probably find out more. I'll find out more Thursday night. We're, we will, Jeff, could you explain how we're gonna get, keep people informed? We're gonna do our best. Um, you know, I, I wanna reiterate what you said, Tom, about the information changing. I mean, the, the What's up on the screen right now is was updated today, um, and one of the big changes was that individuals 65 and over are going to moved up in phase two to second priority. Um, I think that we're we're looking at a lot of options. Obviously, we're going to try and get information out on channel 15 through with FCAT. We're going to put stuff on our website. Um, I'm going to talk to Chief Benjamin about getting the signboard back in the center of town um, with information about a, as different groups become eligible, what did, sort of describing the group as best we can in the limited space we have and where they can get more information. But really the, the best thing for anybody who's listening or watching this right now is to go to the state website. Um, my understanding is that they're gonna be refreshing it at some point this week to be more clear about how to determine if you are eligible currently or what phase you're eligible in and then where you go to get your vaccine and also what you need to bring with you um, because they are gonna be saying, and, and right now I think it's a, it's a self-certification form that says, they haven't put out the phase two self-certification, but this one says, are you a first responder? Are you a home-based healthcare worker? And you basically check a box and say, I'm certifying that I am in phase one. Um, and there, there'll probably be something similar in phase two. Um, so, you know, one of the other things that we can do is put out, a, you know, a code red call or a code red email. Chances are that 
I, don't, I might be exaggerating when I say 90%, but a good portion of the people who receive that call, it will not be applicable to them. Um, they, just because they are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine. And so it might be confusing. So we're trying to do, um, we're trying to do it as communicated as best we can uh, without causing more confusion. Um, you know, we do have a, a list of uh, from from the, the local census that the clerk does every year. Um, we have a pretty good idea of people's addresses and ages. And so we can um, do something like that, uh, you know, direct mailing or, or try and do another type of contact um, through that way, if that would be helpful. Um, so we're looking at, at trying to spread the word as much as we can, but without adding any um, confusion. That's the thing I was thinking about too, was that because I, when I saw the, the emails going around about that was I think the one, the one thing that we haven't been doing before is, and this is assuming we get the information is, is the ma is physical mailings. Because, you know, like we said, you, you can never, no communication method is perfect, you know, because some people will toss out mailings and things like that. But maybe, especially if we have people who um, are at home, don't go out and, you know, don't have computers, maybe we look at like doing a mailing for just a certain segment, maybe of seniors or something like that. You know, we'd have to see how much that costs and everything, but that might be an option. And, and I... And, and Mr. Chair, I, I'm, I'm not really too, and you won't hear me say this often, I'm not so much concerned about the cost. Um, I, I think the, the we're, we're looking at targeting probably less than 300, 300 uh, residents right now. Right, it was, um, but just and, under two, wasn't that I think 175 or something? Well, I, I was going down to the 65 years of age also, Dave. But, okay. Uh, yeah. but, but might be worth it. What 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 my biggest concern is, and when I, and 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 Jeff would try to think now, if someone wants the, the easiest way to get the information that you see on the screen right now from the state is go to the town of town of Sunderland's webpage and, and you can find this pretty quickly. Okay. Or in the infinite wisdom of somebody, this is, you could go to get a, get a get a piece of paper out and write small, you could go to www.mass.gov slash info dash details slash when dash can dash I dash get dash the dash COVID dash 19 dash vaccine. You could do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't ask me why we have to make things so complicated. Um, or you can go to Sunderland Town. Go to our website and get it off from our website. But that that's part of the that's part of the problem with all this stuff is that it, it it's not. I would say it's not intuitive. We make things a lot a lot more complicated than it can. But the state of Massachusetts has, unlike some others states has prioritized it by a phase and and it's supposed to take some of the confusion out right now i think there's a lot of people that are confused also we have we're worried we're trying to talk about how to how to service the people that are homebound as well right. so we're, we're, we're looking at all of that kind all that kind of information right now so we're trying yeah. Jeff, I hate to put you on the spot, but could you just show folks on our website, Jeff, like where it is? That might help a little bit too. Yep. So first, the COVID-19, it's at the top of every page. Um, and then this second update, when can I get the vaccine? If you're here and you want to send an email, and you can also call 211, um, which is uh, staffed by... Or, or paid for by the United Way and extension 26, and they'll be able to answer COVID questions. All right, thank you. That way just folks can see like where, because sometimes you know, we talk about it, but it's good to just toss in a little visual there so folks can see. If I may, 
Yeah. Um, another suggestion might be, I know that the senior center is still delivering lots of meals. Can we start yeah. including flyers and in with the meals to the folks that are homebound? It's a good suggestion, Lori. Correct, Lori. Excuse me? You know, just a quick update. Right, little flyer. flyer. You know, each and, and it, you know, it can obviously our information changes as been said, maybe hour to hour, but you know, just a quick update saying this is what's happening, you know, right. and a flyer included with their meal. It's not a bad idea. Hi, this is Liz Foster. Um, I, I spent a fair amount of time today on the, on the website and also um, the governor had um, a news uh, information session today with uh, several other um, officials from the state. And they went through, you know, a lot of the changes that have that are effective as of February 1st. But one of the biggest things that he kept saying over and over was that all of this, all of the timing, all of the registrations for the for the vaccine, everything depends on the feds getting us the vaccine. And that's still a work in progress. That's true. So, you know, I mean it's it's difficult to know how much to do up front because we don't we just don't know um whether we wind up with you know places where people are waiting for vaccines or places where the place is waiting for people you know it, it's very complicated all right a lot of moving parts to this one yes all right and you're right and we're relying on other groups at the state and federal level so it sort of cascades down so okay. it is a challenge <clears throat> but we are trying to work hard to get all the different communication methods out there. And as we've learned, no one communication method ever works completely. So we kind of have to try them all. So, uh, yes, go ahead. Oh, I don't know. Keith, are you still on? Keith had his hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question for Lori. I heard her say um, we had eight minutes last week. I just wanted to check in to see if we know about how many total cases presently are in town and if any contract contact tracing has yeah. um, indicated any concern with the school? There are currently, hold on. I can answer that, Lori. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there, there are six people um, in isolation as of today um, is, is what I got and none, none, from the school. Uh, none are related to the school. That we have yep. and and there haven't been in a while from, from what i can tell All right thank you very much that's probably a relief from the school perspective so which is yes, good is. yeah <laughs> all right <clears throat> all right thanks any other um covid related topics i'm sure we'll be we'll be discussing that yes good just, just a couple things just one more. um the governor announced last week uh, that as of today, the stay at home advisory has been lifted um, and right. also the uh, so that. curfew, but the, the businesses had to close by 930. That, that was lifted today. Um, I think the limits are still the same, right? They yeah, just, still 25, still 25 percent capacity, but um, the hours have been back lifted. to normal, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. All right, well, we're slowly creeping out of the hole. So <clears throat> thanks for a lot of hard work by a lot of people and everything, so all right. Well, hopefully next week we'll be back with some exciting new updates or some more information and some lower numbers. So I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. Better thanks a lot. Lower numbers. That's yep. right, exactly. All right, thanks a lot, Laurie, appreciate yep. it. Yep, good night. All right. Um, now we'll move on to our select board updates. Um, I'll just go to you, Tom, just because you're like next below me in the little visual box. So um, I'm all set. Thank you, David. All set. All right. Scott. Uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, there's a village center meeting the, the 27th. I think that's Wednesday at uh, seven. And then although it's going to be after our next meeting, capital planning is on the 3rd of February. Um, 
and uh, village center agenda is centered around obviously updates uh, in and around North Main and Sanderson Place, but also the proposed sidewalks that uh, were recently extensions that were sent to us from uh, DOT along Route 116. So it should be yeah, a good discussion. Okay. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that was uh, interesting to see those. So, yep. <sighs> all right. I, I don't have any update. I think we have a personnel committee meeting in a couple of weeks, right, Jeff? I want to say uh, like two weeks or yes, so. Next, yeah. next week. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Getting to be that season, Mr. Chair. It is. It is. The meetings will start piling up. Um, all right, and with that, we turn it over to Jeff with any town administrator updates. No, nothing for me this week. <laughs> Not, nothing other than all the other things that have been going on, right? I'm, I'm, I'm looking <laughs> yeah. at the whiteboard in your yeah. office, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. nothing. <laughs> so put that in quotes. <laughs> right. When you see something checked off, I'll give you an update on it. Okay, okay there, there you, you go. go. Nothing that we haven't covered already, right? All right. Um, so I'll turn that over next over to our public comment section in case anybody has any public comments on anything other than yeah. that we've talked about. Hi, this is Liz again. Um, I'm just oh, uh, putting, <laughs> sorry. I'm no, just okay. putting in a plug um, to recruit some members for our Council on Aging. Um, we are we are in need of members and we have a lot of exciting things on our agenda for the coming year and we could certainly use some help. So if anybody wants to uh, get information on that, they can uh, call our number, uh, which is da -da -da -da, on a piece of paper here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's 350-5178. Um, That's it. That's the whole number, 350-5178. And we also, thank you to the town, have our own email address. And the email is a lot of letters, council on aging at Sunderland, town of Sunderland dot US. Council on aging at town of Sunderland dot US. It's all one stream, doesn't re require spaces or any of that. So no no dashes like Tom's website address you uh, gave earlier. No, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I had actually put it in without um, without anything and then it sort of, the, the computer fixed it, took some spaces, put some spaces in, so. But that works, it go. works to connect to us. So okay. we're, we're, um, we're a happy group and we love company. That's great, perfect, uh, perfect opportunity for the plug there, Liz, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so if anybody's interested in the, joining the Council on Aging, contact that, or uh, you can also just contact Jeff, I'm sure, at, uh, at the town, so, all right. Thank you. That actually ends our official um, business for the evening, unless we have anything else. Our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, February 1st, already moving into February. Um, and just a little update, if you hadn't tuned in last week, we are, have moved our dates for our caucus and town meeting due to the COVID update again. So. <clears throat> Uh, just, we, just, the, just the town meeting, not the caucus. Oh, listen, did we push that back earlier in February? Uh, caucus and elections would require special legislation. We as board can only move the town meeting. That's true. All right. Thank you for, uh, for that correction. All right. Um, if there's Jeff enough. Hand yes, Jeff. Uh, two things. One, Liz's uh, promo reminded me that anybody who's thinking about uh, applying for CPA funds this year, the applications are due by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and the second was, did you want to read the caucus into the record? Do you want me to grab? Oh yes. Before we end, is it is it in the it's in the room Scott's in right? I have paper yes. sheet. I can grab that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We should do that. So the caucus in compliance with Mass General Law, Chapter 53, Section 117 and 118, uh, notice to the inhabitants of the town of Sunderland that a citizen's caucus will be held Saturday, February 27th, 2021 at 10 a.m. at the Sunderland town offices. 
Uh, Wendy Hu will call the caucus to order. Chair is chosen. Purpose of the caucus is nominate for the following town elective officers. Uh, one assessor for three years, one select board for three years, board, one board of health for three years, three library trustees for three years, one moderator for one year, one planning board for five years, one planning board for two years, one Riverside Cemetery trustee for three years, and the Sunderland Elementary School Committee, two members for three years. And again, that's the 27th at 10 a.m. at the town office building. In your car. Different. Go ahead, Tom. In your cars. In your car, that's right. It'll be a, your cars, a right. in the car one. So no snow that week. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Do we, uh, if there's nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Ah, nice use of the hands, Tom. I like that. <laughs> second. second. All right. All those in front. <laughs> it was left left for a second. It wasn't a vote. Oh. Well, that's right. <laughs> All those in favor of a German at, uh, what was it, 758? <laughs> Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, folks, and we'll see you next week.